morning. Could you take your swords and open up to James chapter 4, please? James chapter 4. We're going to have you look at two different chapters, but we're going to stay in this one for a few minutes. Um, but why don't we pray first, and then we'll get into the first six verses of chapter 4. Father, thank you for um, the ability, the freedom to come to church, any church in this country, Lord. Thank you for the people that are here that will be listening. I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just uh, once again open up your word to us so that we can receive it and hide it in our hearts. I pray for us all here, Lord, that sometimes we get set in our ways spiritually and you are always growing us, maturing us, developing us. Do that once again today, Lord. Father, we want to glorify you in your son's name. And we know we just rely on the power of the Holy Spirit for that to happen. And we just ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my dad was in World War II. The title of today's message is The Great War. The Great War. My dad was in the Army, and the day after Pearl Harbor was bombed, he was sent there. I think at the time he was a lieutenant or a lieutenant major. So he was there. And I can't even imagine, you know, that era, if you have a father that is older or maybe past now, but it, in their 90s, close to 100, they didn't talk about things like they do now, right? They just didn't open up. And in the message today called The Great War, I want to show you that even though we know there are wars going on throughout the world today, the greatest war that's going on it's inside our individual hearts, right? If, if we really are honest, it's inside our hearts. It's what, how we are doing in our relationship with God. And when you think about that, if you really are honest with yourself, we're never going to get there till we see him face to face, correct? There's always going to be a journey, but it's a battle sometimes. We all know that. So with that in mind, let's take a look at James chapter 4. Now, this book was written to the churches, and we're going to go into Romans. That was written to the Roman church. So understand that these words are to the church people of this time, of that time and this time. But follow along, please, as I read verses 1 to 6 of James chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In Genesis 3, we see... I have three words underlined up there, saw, pleasant, and desirable. Three things that all of us can relate to, what we look at, what turns us on and turns us off, what's pleasant, and what do we desire. Now, as believers in Jesus, hopefully we all desire a closer walk with him. But just as human beings, what do we desire? Certain type of clothes, certain type of car, certain type of friends. I mean, you can apply that desire to all different things. But notice, this was the thing that caused the woman in the garden to fall and the husband followed. So how do we know 
seeing what's pleasant and desirable. How do we come to that conclusion? How do we come to that decision? If what we're seeing, what we're thinking, what we desire is lining up with the things that God would have for us. Now, this is just really a breakdown of what we just read in James chapter 4. Desires for pleasure. We all like to have a good time. We all like to have fun. We all like to do things. I mean, we have the junior high and the senior high in here today. And you guys and girls know there's certain things you like to do. There's certain things you don't like to do. But notice in James 4, it says you lust, you murder, you covet. Now, some of you might have never murdered, but I'm pretty sure all of you get gotten angry at somebody. And if it's an unrighteous anger, God compares it to murder because it's something in our heart that needs to be changed. Our heart needs to be changed. We covet things. We lust after things. We want things. And you know what happens when we get those things? We usually want and lust after something else because the issue is not the item, is it? It's something that's in our heart. It's something that's deep-seated that God wants to change. You ask and do not receive, and you ask amiss. How many of us can say, well, I prayed for that to happen. I prayed for this to happen. I prayed for that person, but nothing ever seems to happen. Well, maybe you ask amiss. Maybe you ask with the wrong motives. Maybe you ask according to your will and not according to God's will. Now, remember, this letter to James was written to the churches. And notice what was in James 4, the adulterers and adulteresses. These are church people. And we know from a physical standpoint that can happen. But let's take it deeper. Let's take it to a spiritual standpoint. That, you know, when we put something in the place of God, it's like an adulterous affair. We have another lover. We have someone or something else that we put the, in place of Jesus Christ. And I think we can all say at one time or another, we've been all guilty of spiritual adultery. Notice that friendship with the world is enmity with God. It's a separation. There, it, there, it's not connected. There's a war going on. Now notice the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. And it's not a bad jealousy. It's a jealousy because God wants the best for you, because he loves you. He created you. He died for you. Whether you're here or not, and you don't even know that, it doesn't matter. He still did that. He still created you. He still died on the cross for you. And whether you ever receive him or you continue to deny him, he will love you. The greatest love that man or woman, child has ever known, teenager have has ever known, is what Jesus Christ has shown us through his death on the cross and his resurrection. God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. All of us in here today, all of us that will watch this or listen to this, we all have in us pride, don't we? There's still vestiges of pride in there. And you know what pride does? It keeps us from hum humbling ourselves before the Lord so he can do something in our hearts, so he can change us from the people we are to the people he wants us to be. Now, if you've been a Christian for any time, you know that you had to humble yourself before the Lord. You had to recognize, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't make it on my own in this on this planet. I depend on you. Things don't always go right whether you're Christian or you're non-Christian. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the same for everybody. But God wants us to humble ourselves before him so that he is Lord, so that he can do the things. As the first European war since Napoleon, great simply indicated the enormous scale of a conflict, much as we might talk today of a great storm or a great flood. However, the term also had moral uh, connotations. The Allies believed that they were fighting against an evil military that had taken hold of Germany. In World War I, 
40 million military and civilian casualties, 20 million deaths, 21 million wounded, and 9.7 million military personnel, 10 million civilians. And if those numbers all don't add up, you know why? Because that takes into account some of the enemy, some of the people they never found, some of the people they didn't know. In World War II, over 85 million casualties in World War II. It's considered the deadliest war in history. Imagine that. But I want to say to you that in every war, there are physical casualties, mental casualties, social cas casualties, and spiritual casualties. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it talks about entering by a narrow gate. For wide is a gate and broad is a way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in and buy it. Because narrow is a gate and difficult is a way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We asked the junior high to sit in today. Because, as most of you know, I, a couple years ago I retired of 44 years of teaching in a public school, grades 7 through 12. And I want to say this to everybody that's here. You are in a battle. I am in a battle. doesn't matter our age. And before this teaching is over, young people, understand that you're in a war every time you walk into your school. I don't care if it's a public school, a private school, a parochial school. It doesn't matter. There's a war going on. Because where God's word is not proclaimed and elevated, there is a war for your mind, your heart, and your soul. And that's why it's so important to have your face in the book so when you're hearing things from other outside sources that you can compare it to God's word and say, right on or right off. It doesn't fit. This is contrary to what we believe. But you can't just absorb everything like you're a sponge and think everything's okay, because everything is not okay. There is a war going on, and it's transforming our world, it's transforming society. There's division, not only in our country, there's division throughout the world. Why is this happening? Because it goes down to the individual hearts of men and women, teenagers, boys and girls. In Luke 23, 23 to 24, someone asked the Lord, will those who are saved be a few. And Jesus said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. And there's two paths that we're going to look at for the next few minutes. There is a right way and a wrong way. There's a right way and a wrong way. Not all the ways and not all destinations are equally good. One leads to life and the other to destruction. Remember, the physical, the mental, the social, and the spiritual. The mind of a person, the heart of a person, the soul of a person can be a living hell to that person. But Jesus Christ said he came to set the captives free. He came and, died and became a little baby, grew up went to a cross, died, suffered for you and me to set us free from the things that are plaguing this world. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But to all who did receive him, speaking of Jesus, who believed in Jesus' name, he gave the right to become the children of God. There are two families. There's a family of God and the family of the devil very clear that you're on one side or the other. There's no middle ground. It's a choice that we all have with our X amount of years on this earth, right? We're only here. There's no guarantee. One day, 100 years, there's no guarantee. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am a way. He didn't say, I am a truth. And he didn't say, I am a life. He said, I am the way, the only way, the truth, the only truth, the life, the only life. We're all entitled to our opinions. But God tells us his opinion. And guess who wins? 
Acts 4.12 says, and there's salvation in no one else. Doesn't say, and there's salvation in a few. And here's your choices. A, B, and C, multiple choice, right? Kids, we love multiple choice questions. At least if I studied, I think I remember that one. But then I spilled my Cheerios. I'm not sure. Is Cheerios a, a, one of the selections? And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. No other choice. The narrow way equals the way of the godly. The broad way equals the way of the ungodly. The broad way is usually an easier way. The broad way is very attractive, permissive, self-indulgent. The way of the world, very few rules, very few restrictions, very few requirements. Sin is tolerated. God's word is ignored. There's no standards. Whatever feels good, do it. No spiritual maturity. No moral character, no commitment, and no sacrifices. Even churches today say, well, we're not concerned with morals. How does that happen? I can't, I can't fathom that. That makes no sense to me. I don't understand that at all. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man and a woman and a teenager and a child, but its end is the way of death. You see, God loves us so much that he throws in here, he gives of his word so we can read it and see the difference between some of the things we're hearing and some of the things that we're reading. And then we have a choice. Which one are we going to choose? You've heard me say this before. It was very helpful to me when I said, well, is Jesus Christ lying to me or is he telling me the truth? Is he lying or is he telling me the truth? And I chose, he's telling me the truth of who he is, what he's done, what's going to happen. The broad way is usually centered around yourself. It's really based on self-absorption. It's usually that pride. Remember, we talked about pride and, and being humble. It's usually that holier-than-thou attitude. You know, it's comparing yourself to others. But you know what? If we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, how do you do? I don't do too good. Here's me. Here's you. Okay, guys, we're going to try to jump and touch the, the balcony. Now, maybe you got some ups, and you can make it to that first pew. Maybe some of you can make it to the second. I'd like to see that. It'd be cool to see the second and third pew. I'm only going to make it maybe halfway down. So no matter how far you go, and how far I go, guess what? We both fell. We both fell short of that, touching that balcony. The broad way, people are unwilling to trust, to rely on Jesus alone. They rely on their feelings. They rely on their philosophies. They rely on the things that they see that's pleasant to their eyes, what they desire. They're unwilling to pay the price. It costs too much for them to give up the world, even though the world is deteriorating. It's, it's running out. They're unwilling to leave behind the baggage of sin, to repent, to turn, to leave their lifestyle, to start a new lifestyle. They're, they have a self-will instead of a God will. They're wrapped up in material things, not spiritual things. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You ever lose something valuable? Do we go after Jesus the same way we look for that object that we lost? Interesting question. Or if you think you left something behind, you're already on your way to work, or, or you, know, you forgot something, you, you have to trace back all your steps to see if you can find it. That narrow way is a harder way than the broad way. It's demanding. You can't save yourself. It's coming, to that it's coming to that idea. I can't save myself. I can't figure this out without Christ. Lord, I'm humbling myself before you. Only Jesus saves. I have to deny myself daily. Seld, I don't know what that language is. Mila, that might be your language, Seld. Is that Arabic? My buddy's here from Israel, so. 
self, it should be self-denial, and the cross. We have to embrace the cross. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And then in Mark, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, that world that's perishing, and loses his own soul? In the long run, that's crazy. Why would you even do that? I heard about the tragedy, right, just a few days ago with the uh, young kids in East Brunswick and in Carter Red walking on thin ice and fell through. There was a boy in Carteret that died and a boy in East Brunswick that died. 13 years old. They're gone. They're gone. All of us here have today that wasn't guaranteed yesterday, right, guys and girls? It wasn't guaranteed yesterday. It's a gift from God. What are we going to do with what he's given us today? Is it drawn closer to him? Matthew 10, 28, it says, And do not fear those who kill the body but not can, cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that's referring to God. It comes down to God. You receive him into your heart as your Savior and Lord. Follow him one day. You'll enter into your king, his kingdom where he built you a home for you. He's building that right now. You reject him. You chose that way not to follow him here. Well, guess what? You won't follow him in eternity either. And you'll be in a place that he's prepared for the devil and his angels, but it's also there for the people who don't want Jesus as part of their life. Please open to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, verse 11. Now, I showed you the problem. I think we all understand we got a problem. But there is good news. There is a solution. But in that solution, we have to be aware of some of the things that are going on right in our country, right in our world, that we need to pray. We need to have wisdom. We need to pray for everyone, including the saved and unsaved. So Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 11. We're just going to read down to 14. But I'm going to emphasize the underlined mess, uh, words up there. If you notice, they're in red. But just follow along, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now... It is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. One of the things it says there is to awake out of sleep. Now, in the Bible, sleep in some contexts is, is talking about a Christian's death, physical death. We go to sleep. We wake up in the presence of the Lord. In a twinkling, in a blink of an eye, Lincoln, you're in the presence of Jesus. So you really don't know death the way the world perceives it. You go to sleep and you wake up in God's presence. But there is also another context where sleep has to do with spiritual laziness, an apathy. Example, seventh graders, sixth graders, seniors, all you high school and junior high, what are you thinking about right now? And this would apply to adults, some adults also. Hopefully not as many as the teenagers. What are you thinking of right now? 
One of you might be saying, well, there's no Super Bowl today. It's next Sunday. Some of you might be thinking, oh, man, mom's got a great meal when we go home. Or we're going to that, my favorite restaurant. Understand, all those things by themselves are okay. But you know what? They're all physical stuff. How many of us right now are just praying, Lord, talk to me through this message. Talk to me through what I'm reading in your word. Awaken my heart. Awaken my spirit. So when I leave here today and I go to school tomorrow or go to work, I'm a little changed. I'm a little more alert. I'm a little more in tune with how you want to use me to be a light to the people I'm with who right now are spiritually dead. Not sleeping, they're dead. You have to be born again in order to be spiritually alive. And you can only be born again by receiving Jesus Christ what he did at the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and invite him into your heart, the risen Lord into your heart. We need to leave the darkness. How much darkness are we in? Right? We can shut off all the lights and try to black out all the windows and maybe just a ray of, maybe we'll just leave one window uh, blind open and we have some light. So I can, I can reach into the light and you can see my arm and if I pull back, I'm in the darkness. How much is that, does that apply to you and me? How much are we in the light, and how much of us are still in the darkness? Remember, Romans and James was written to the churches. It was written to the people in the church, the ones who said they believed in Jesus Christ. We need to always be coming into more of the light. We need to put on Jesus as we saw in Romans. And we'll talk a little bit more of that. Uh, as we get closer to the end of the message. Sleep. Indifference to spiritual realities on the part of believers. Indifference. Ah, no big deal. I've compromised in a lot of areas in my life. No big deal. You know, I just roll with the punches. I'm saved. Everything's cool. There are spiritual realities that exist. History has proven this. And Jesus proved it, spoke about it. God exists, sin exists. If you're a believer in Jesus, you know that you at one time had a broken relationship with him, right? And if you are a Christian, you also know that you can still sin and mess up that relationship. And until you confess your sin, because he's just and right to forgive you your sins, he'll restore that relationship. It's just like a, with a person. We can be best of friends. Something comes between us and there's a rift. And until we repair it, that rift will always be there. And that can happen, as we know, on the job, in the school, on a team, in your family, it doesn't matter. John 3.16, and we should never get tired of this, should we? probably the most famous verse in the scripture that even the world knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Heaven and hell exist. Jesus talked about. And the book of life exists. The book that if when you receive Jesus into your heart, your name was written in the book of life. Not everybody's in the book of life. And we need to pray our enemies and our friends who aren't in the book of life. 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Again, continuing in 1 Thessalonians 5.8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Putting on, in Romans 13, we read about putting on Jesus Christ. How do you put on, like I'm looking at you right now, you have all different kinds of clothes and sweaters and jackets, right? You know, that's what you chose. You chose that. I see what you chose to wear. You see what I chose to wear today. That was a choice I made. So when we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're making a choice. We're taking him into our heart. And what we're saying is, when you look at me, when you see things happen in our lives, when adversity comes, when pressure comes, you're seeing who I am in Jesus. 
how immature, how mature, where I am in my walk with the Lord. Do we blow it at times when pressure cookers on? Absolutely, we all do. But you know what? Isn't it cool to mature in Christ and the things that used to set you off don't set you off anymore? Is there a new problem that you have to deal with? Yeah, there is, because God is always, we're works under construction. God is always working on us to bring us to that point, to sanctify us daily, all, that, all those great things. But this soberness of putting on and putting on, sober, to be of a sound mind, to be under control of what you're thinking, to be in one's right mind. Remember the paths. What paths? The path that you're on also dictates what you're thinking. Right? The path that you're on dictates what mind you're thinking with. To exercise self-control, to put a moderate estimate upon oneself. Think of oneself soberly. Choosing your steps wisely. Counting the cost. What is the effect going to be on my relationship with the Lord? What's my effect going to be on my relationship with my wife or my daughter or my friends and my colleagues? Whether they're saved or unsaved, doesn't matter. What's the effect when the choice that I make? Notice the last thing is to curb one's passions. Now, passion is good if it's controlled and set in the right direction, but there's also passions that can break our relationship with the Lord. 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Did you know you're a soldier in God's army, every one of you, boys, girls, teens, adults? You're all soldiers. God uses that throughout Scripture, comparing us to soldiers, to warriors. He's given us a sword, God's holy word, to fight the battles that we are all going to have to face throughout our life and have faced and continue, will continue to face until God takes us home. Notice verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I'm not going to get distracted by the things of the world. Remember, I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. God's changed me from the inside out as I continue to develop my relationship with him. Now, there's a war going on in our planet. That war started back, I believe, between Genesis verse 1 and verse 2. I believe there was a war in heaven between Lucifer and the angels, a third of the angels that followed him. We see it when we, we see it in the fall of Adam and Eve. We see it in the fall of Cain when he killed his brother Abel. There was a war that started, that, that those hard issues started. There's a war on our planet that religion must die. Seeking uh, someone outside of our planet. It's got to die. That's one of the things they're saying is holding back the progress of this earth. They're saying all religion is good except those that are exclusive. Those that are exclusive are Christianity, Judaism. Guess what other ones exclusive? Islam. But you know what? It's funny. They don't attack Islam like they do Judaism and Christianity. Huh. Food for thought. Why is that happening? Worldview is better instead of a biblical view. Do you know that we're in a either a mindset of a biblical worldview or a worldly view? Where are you? Are you somewhere between or you're all on one side or all on the other? Atheistic, scientific-based worldview. Now, there are a lot of scientists that are believers, but there's also atheists, and they try to push their view. They don't want God to be in the equation. Now, a lot we see are on the political left. Not all of them. There's wacko Republicans, too. You know what I'm saying? But we're seeing a lot of verbiage from the political left. The new atheist evangelists. Did you know there's new atheists? They term, they term them new atheists that are evangelists who go out to spread some of the things that I'm briefly touching on. You can investigate this on your, on your own. But they use science to try to convince that there's no God. 
you know, it's an evolution or the Big Bang or whatever. They use a lot of rhetoric. They use a lot of words, a lot of verbs to try to just confuse you, to make them sound intelligent. They say that religion is a fantasy that people must wake up from. Well, you know what? The United States of America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. The beginning of this country was rooted in the scriptures. And there's a root of war that's going on. It's been going on. This is nothing new, everybody. This has been going on. Our roots of our Judeo-Christian heritage are being attacked. Now, it's nothing new because the enemy started this way back in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, did God really say that? You sure? I don't think so. I think God's lying to you because he, he knows that if you eat from this tree, you're going to be just like him, and he doesn't want any competition. You can be just like God. Did you know Karl Marx made this statement, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creatures, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of a soulless condition. It's the opium of the people. So he attacked religion. He was an atheist. He also said to abolish religion as the illusionary happiness of the people is to demand their real happiness. Basically saying, hey, the only way you're really going to be happy on this planet is if you abolish religion and any belief in a, in a God or a supreme being. And this other guy, M. Arnold, said, you know, we need to replace religion with literature. Read to increase your knowledge. This will solve the world's problems. And um, again, this is something to ask. Young people, how many of you have been taught about a Marx? How many of you have been taught about a Hitler? Hitler said, he who owns who owns the youth gains the future. Remember what I said at the beginning. How many of you know the Bible and also, as you're being taught, can compare, oh, yeah, this is good stuff they're teaching us today. This is good stuff. No, this is not good. I'm not going to receive that into my heart. This is good. You've got to, the universities, they say that over 85% of college students go into a university, believers in God, come out no longer following God. What takes place? What's going on? Something's happening. And going back to Harpo, I mean, uh, Karl Marx. Education is free. Freedom of education shall be enjoyed under the condition fixed by law and under the supreme control of the state. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the women, did God, or the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? There's a radical faith that we have to have. Why is it a war? Because there's two worldviews. The number one view is biblical. Salvation of sinners, sin nature equals problems. The doctrine of sin accounts for the problems in the world. Then the second viewpoint is the worldview. War on religious liberty. One of the founding principles of this country, that is a major problem for the country. What they are trying to do to erase religion. Remember those atheists. The evangelical atheist, a war on religious liberty, moves society away from theology's guiding light, erase religion, replace it initially with socialism, and then eventually communism. There is a, um, a building, it's Emancipation Hall in Washington, D.C., recently new. It, this is a picture of the Capitol Visitor Center. There's no reference to the Christian faith on any of the, th of the things they have there. If you go to some of the monuments that have been here for a long time, they'll have Bible verses, stuff like that, and even these atheists are trying to get those erased. Does anybody know, and I'm asking, well, everybody, how many people know what the Mayflower Compact is? Anybody ever hear of that? Honestly. Not many, right? Uh, junior high, senior high, have you been taught about the Mayflower Compact? Anybody? Any kids? Check this out. The Mayflower Compact was important because it was the first document to establish self-government in the New World. 
I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in this Mayflower Compact, it says, we've undertaken this for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of the king and country. And I'm going to jump down a little bit. Solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our bettering, for our better ordering and preservation and for furtherance of the ends mentioned. Notice, for the glory of God, how important was it to the people who signed this Mayflower Compact to have this go through? Our Constitution, I don't know if you know this now, especially the young people and probably the millennials. I don't know if you were taught this when you were in school. There are two Christian doctrines in the Constitution. One is justification by grace through faith. The founders created a government based on checks and balances, with checks and balances, because they knew of the sin nature of man. They also, in the Constitution, talk about the priesthood of believers. All men are created equal. The free exercise clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There is a war going on. A war is going on to undo these beliefs and the American principles that are tied to it. As I wrap up here, I want to show you a couple things. Here are some of the casualties of war. Christian prayer removed from the schools back in the, like, 62, 63, 1962 or 63. Second, not as opposed to other religions and their practices as they are to Judaism or Christianity. Right here in New Jersey, you can look it up on YouTube just a little while ago, students were made to memorize portions of the Koran, but were not expected to memorize anything from the Bible. They told they could not do that. Islam and the left both oppose Christianity. The start of this U.S. war that we physically saw was back in the 60s. So all of you born after the 60s, were, you just came up figuring this is the way it is. You didn't know really that there was another way before this. There was one time in the public schools that the Bible was used, but it was removed in the 60s. Atheists then try to silence Christians, violation of their constitutional rights, same sorts of things that fascists have done and continue to do so. 95% of the population back then in the 60s believed in God, and 60% belonged to religious organizations. The courts removed prayer and Bibles without the vote of the people. The people selected to do that. Now, I want to uh, wrap this up here because we have a, um, our friend Mila is going to share. So I want to do that very quickly, and maybe another time we'll come back to the second half of this. But a lot of the things that are in our country today, uh, whether you talk about contraception or parts of women lim liberation or abortion rights, have come as a result of court decisions without the will of the American people. This is important. That's why it's so crucial that we all, who can vote, vote. Whoever you vote for. But again, look for those candidates, whether it be in our state or in our country, that promote biblical values. That's so important. Um, if you were here this past Wednesday night, Malad Khoury uh, is here from Israel. He's a missionary that you and I support here at this church. So if you didn't get his uh, CD, you can get it after service. Malad I've known for about 12 years. Um, he goes throughout the Middle East working with Arab, Christian, Jewish, uh, Palestinian youth, trying to bring them together. And he's going to come up for about five minutes and share his testimony. And then uh, I'm going to come back and wrap it up with the final part of the message. Uh, Malad also has brochures, uh, cards outside. Feel free to take them. He is uh, supported throughout 
uh, our country and the Middle East by sponsors. So if you would like to sponsor him, you know, pray about it. See, everything's on the brochure. He would love that. That would be great. Bottom line is pray for him because he goes to Iraq and all those places to deal with these young people. So how about a nice uh, round of applause for Milad? Privilege to be with you this morning. Um, while uh, Coach Vinny, Pastor Vinny was speaking, something really important stirred in my heart. And the word was the Marines. I believe the Lord is calling us to be in Marines right now in this season of 2020. The bell is much everywhere we go. And just yesterday I was walking in uh, the city of New York with my friends. And I asked my friends, one was believer, the other two uh, girls, I asked them, do you believe in Jesus? And she said, I believe in God, but I don't practice. I say, so do you want to drink cold water or hot water? <laughs> That's mean like we are kind of in a place that the Lord wants us to be in Marines for Jesus. I grew up in Gaza Strip, born in Nazareth, living in Bethlehem. So where Jesus was born? Anybody know? In Bethlehem. So good job. So I'm from Bethlehem, living there right now. Also grew up in Gaza Strip, living in both places, in Israel, Palestinian territories. The Lord is calling us to be a vassals, wherever he's sending us, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I'm a psychologist and also minister. But the point is how to be ambassadors for Jesus. And I accepted Jesus when I was five years old. Uh, can somebody believe in Jesus when he's five years old? Can. So God sees the children. He loves the children. And I just want to encourage you in this time. If you didn't encounter the love of Jesus Christ, he's able to encounter you right now. His love can change your heart. His love can do radical things. My name, I didn't say my name, my name is Milad Khoury. Milad means birth, Khoury means priest. So we are very unique Arab Christian believers. And we love Jesus. That's simple. We love Jesus. And we practice Jesus. Not even the word practice. <laughs> but we are disciplined. We are the Marines for Jesus. And I just want to encourage you. I love the battles. You know what is the battles? I love when somebody is saying, okay, like Coach Vinny was mentioning specific things right now, that you have to walk with Jesus. And walking with Jesus is really a real battle. You're going to encounter spiritual attacks. You might encounter people that they will not like you even. But it's battle because when we are in battle, we can be in peace because we know that we are connected with the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. He is our Prince of Peace. And there is no political solution. Many people is involved with politics, okay? But Jesus is only the solution for the Middle East right now. People are searching. And I just want to show this verse, this picture, I'm sorry, just was sending this picture in just a few seconds. But Luke 10 too, we all know this verse. The laborers, I believe they are the Marines. I believe that they want more right now in the Middle East Marines. The laborers who are speaking about Jesus. He told them the harvest is plentiful and then the workers are few. So pray for the Lord of the harvest will send his labors into the Middle East, into America, into New York right now. There are many homeless. Yesterday I saw, it's so broken. The city is really needy. You are very close to the city. 
I believe God is asking you right now. The passion for Jesus is to go to the poor people. I'm glad that I got extra ticket for the bus. And the homeless say, can you help me? I say, man, I just have this ticket. Just take it away. Enjoy it. I hope this guy can uh, enjoy it. But <laughs> good things. But the point is just, Lord, give us wisdom. Give us the timing when to go. So love both communities. Love the Arabs. Love the Jews, Israelis, Palestinians. Jesus calling us from Matthew 5 also. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So I just want to share this message with you to inspire your heart. The Lord wants to change our hearts, to love our enemies. The moment we love our enemies, the moment we are in love with Jesus, we can love our enemies. And this is the reality of Christianity, the Bible. Amen. So I just want to share this with you for a short time. I don't know if Coach... Pastor Vinny, where is he? But, but, so probably he's in basketball court, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it's really wonderful that he is in basketball. <laughs> Sir Knight, my name is Sir Lost a lot. Who are you? I am Sir Found. Uh, can I help you? Good day, good night. My name again is Sir Lost a lot. Good day, good night. I am Sir Found. Where is King Earth? Ah, uh, he said the dentist is getting his teeth crowned. Maybe you can help. I just came from a battle, and a knight in armor was killed, and we have to bury him. And I don't know what to put on his tombstone. I know what you could put. You could put rust in peace. Whenever I get upset or stressed, I like to read books by that king um, who sits at the round table when he writes. You mean King Arthur? Who invented the round table? That would be circumference. Are you married? Yeah, I'm married to a princess, actually. Wow. How'd you find her? I follow her footprints. I always feel like I'm living in the dark ages. Well, uh, you are a knight with a mask on. Uh, do you ever take it off to let the light in? Heavens no. Are you serious? Uh, yeah, I'm serious, man. And, uh, you know, that's, that's part of your problem. Well, what do you mean? Well, you hide behind your mask. I noticed that you don't. Well, that's because I wear two sets of armor. Two sets? Is that in case you go golfing and get a hole in one? No, man. Uh, the King of Kings gave me the other set. Is he the king who lives in Camelot? You know, people make up stories about the nightlife there, but Camelot is just a, you know, a lot where people park their camels. Well... I do not know him, but I know I've had a lot of sleepless nights lately. You need to meet the King of Kings. When can I? Right now, Sir Lost a lot. A long time ago, a baby was born in Bethlehem, Israel. This baby was prophesied in Old Testament writings. It was no ordinary baby, but the King of Kings, you know, God himself, who became one of us in order to die on a cross to pay for your sins and mine as well as the sins of the world, the whole world. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Well, I know that I'm a sinner and I haven't lived up to God's perfect standards both in my physical life as well as my thought life. The things that I failed to do and the things that I should have done. I would like to believe and put my trust in this King Jesus and start a relationship with the King of Kings. Well, you have to put your faith in him and what he has done. You know, you must turn from your ways of doing, repentance, 
Um, he equips you by giving you his Holy Spirit that enables you then to live a life following the king. I'm ready to put my faith in him. Okay, well, you know, repeat after me. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I know I am a sinner. I know that I am a sinner. I know that you died on a cross. And I know that you died on the cross. And shed your blood to pay the penalty for my sins. And shed your blood to pay the penalty for my sins. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I want to follow you. And I want to follow you. I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. Thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit. Amen. What now? Well, you got some light in you now. Read the Bible and find a church that goes through the whole Bible verse by verse. So you get the whole counsel of God, not just bits and pieces of his word. And try to attend at least once, if not even twice a week. Is going to our meeting at the square table enough for me to grow spiritually? Not really. You know, Even though there are friends there that identify with you and what you're going through, God tells us to meet together with other believers in him to grow in his word and interact and feast together on his teachings, to grow in faith, grace, and the knowledge of him. Our faith grows as a result of the time that we spend in his word. What about the second set of armor that you said that you have on? So the second one I have on is in Ephesians 6. You can find it there. It talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Our knightly armor is actually a great example of what the King of Kings equips us with once we put our trust in him and his commands. Um, before I go to battle today, could you explain that to me? Yeah, so uh, you're going to put this armor on and you're never taking it off, not even while you sleep. All right, so you can stand against the strategies of the devil. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, which are angels who rebelled against God, which we now know as demons. You said it's comparable to the armor I have on, like the belt? Yes, God gives us a belt of truth. Everything else is attached to the truth that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. How about the breastplate? Well, he gives us a breastplate of righteousness that protects our heart because we know we have a right standing with God as a result of our trust in his death and resurrection. And how about the footwear? Just like we have our battle footwear that keeps our foot from slipping and we can hold our ground so we have the good news of peace so people don't have to slip into despair and depression. How about the shield? God gives us this uh, shield of faith to put out the fiery darts of the devil. The helmet? He gives us the helmet of salvation that protects our minds so we know what are God's thoughts versus the enemy's thoughts. And how about the sword? Well, the true sword is this right here. He gives us the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Is that what church is like and what I can learn? Yes, it is, sir. Lost a lot. Would you mind addressing me from now on as Sir Saved? Sure, Sir Saved. You are now a new person in Jesus Christ. You know, the old Christ, the old knight is gone. The new knight is here. Thank you, Sir Found. Good night. Good night, Sir Saved. I'm going to go. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. great uh, example of when you become a believer in Jesus that you get the spiritual armor of God. But just like armor, it needs to be put on and it needs to be polished, it needs to be used, to exercise. And that's what we're doing right now. We're exercising. We're getting into God's Word. We're stronger when now than when we came in here. You know, when you have your daily devotions and you read God's Word, you're, you're polishing, you're getting sharper, you're, you're equipping yourself with the word of God, which is like a sword that a soldier uses. But you know what? You can't have any of this if you first don't join his army. You can't just walk on to his army. You see, Jesus, a couple thousand years ago, went to the cross 
shed his blood for all the things that we touched on today and more and more. You, like me, sinners, fallen short of the perfect standards of God. But God so loved us that he sent his son to die on the cross. And as the worship team uh, plays, if you are here today and you've never received Jesus, or maybe you want to rededicate your life, you know, and get back on the battlefield, because there is a battlefield. It's a real battle. It's for the heart and souls of boys and girls, teenagers and adults. The enemy never sleeps. So when we go to bed tonight as believers in Jesus, we keep on our spiritual armor. We never take it off. We're washed in the word of God. We have his Holy Spirit in us. If you would like to start that battle, if you would like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, please come up. We'll pray with you. I might even give you my helmet. Who knows? But come on up, and we would love for you to join the family and army of God.